So um, now let's get started with our session. And um, hi, everyone, and welcome to this session named How Can Investors Be Ambassadors for Water? This session is co-hosted by C CDP, CIWI, and the Sweden Sustainable Investment Forum. We have been acti active in a multi-stakeholder collaboration where we have explored concrete ways that investors can take action. And we are also joined here by a fantastic set of speakers and panelists, which I'm super excited to hear more from a little bit later on in the session, and they will also be introduced later on. And a small housekeeping point that um, if you do have any questions or thoughts in general, uh, please post them in the chat box on the Pathable platform, because we will not be using the chat here uh, in, the, in the Zoom room. And if you have a question that's addressed towards a specific speaker, just please uh, tell us who, who that is. So the reason that we wanted to bring this session to you today is because we cannot achieve a resilient world unless the financial system is also aligned with this objective. In other words, a world where everyone has access to clean water and sanitation, where the climate crisis is addressed, where ecosystems are recognized for the instrumental value to humanity, the planet, our economies, is not possible unless we all work together. And today, the financial sector does have immense influence over which companies receive investments and loans, and therefore which economic activities are considered to be financially viable. So obviously, the financial sector's main focus is to generate returns on behalf of their clients, which include many of us who are um, pension savings, for example. But we really argue that it's not quite as simple as that. And in the future, can anyone make any money if we reach a point where we have constant extreme weather events, depleted natural resources and unreliable water access? And we're seeing a lot of steps in the right direction. One often quoted example is when Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, officially declared that BlackRock sees climate risk as investment risk. However, BlackRock still does hold a lot of investments in fossil fuels, so clearly phasing out certain types of investments is not easy, and changing the entire financial system is not easy, even for an investor like BlackRock. These sorts of things, they do take time. And the water crisis is even more complex than that of um, fossil fuels. To address the water crisis, we can't just uh, reduce water use like we need to do with fossil fuels, but we also need to control water pollution and pay attention to local ecosystems. Water is highly localized, yet it's a global issue. Water is made further complicated by the disconnect between its price and its value. In current economic doctrines, we are often taught that all information you need about a good is in the price. But water is not an economic good like any other. Um, it, is, it is highly uh, underpriced today, um, and still its value is of course immense. And even though most of us do recognize that the price of water does not reflect its actual values, its, its immense set of values, it is the price that often guides the way in which we consume it, together with whatever regulation is in, in place. So this low price has meant that we are currently depleting rivers and groundwater aquifers, through both overuse and pollution. And this is of course harmful in the long run as water is a necessary input to almost all economic activities. Sufficient water that is also clean is vital for the functioning of any ecosystem and the services upon which many industries rely upon. Access to water is of course also a human right which includes communities along the supply chain. Further, having sustainable water management is crucial. It's a crucial part of climate resilience work as global warming will disrupt the water cycle immensely as mentioned um, extensively in the latest IPCC report. Because of this, water is simply not an add-on to go on top of everything else. Water does need to be an integral part of investment decisions if a firm is going to consider sustainability. And as I have alluded to, water is not just an environmental issue. It's also, it's relevant to all of ESG, also the social and the governmental. So we really do need to move away from thinking in silos of thinking about the E and the S and the G as separate things towards systems thinking where we recognize that all of these things are connected. So how can investors work for water security? How can they ensure that companies are moving towards sustainable water practices? 
In short, how can investors be ambassadors for water? So we'll explore this more closely in our session here and we together with CDP and the Sweden Sustainable Investment Forum is releasing a report as well later this year where this will be explored, which we're very excited to um, share with all of you. So with that, uh, I'm gonna say thank you and hand over to Emily of CDP who will give a keynote. And after that, we will have a panel discussion with our fantastic speakers that we have with us here today. Emily, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. It's my pleasure to set the stage for a dynamic discussion among the experts from the capital markets uh, regarding the importance of water stewardship, uh, as Sarah highlighted. Uh, in my role as Global Director for Capital Markets at CDP, I work alongside my, my dedicated team and 600 of the world's largest financial institutions and investors to engage companies uh, and transition their businesses to serve the future of a global economy that can operate within planetary boundaries. And as Sarah highlighted, water is critical, although a frequently sidelined element of global economy. The complex interdependencies among companies, communities, governments, regulators, and natural ecosystems uh, have been increasingly thrust to the forefront. Most recently, we've seen uh, three days of torrential storms plaguing the eastern seaboard of the United States as, Ur as Hurricane Henri swept through. Um, and just last week, the massive flooding uh, north of Stockholm, where we saw daily lives drowned by the flows of water. Last month, the catastrophic flooding in Germany resulted in not only tragic loss of life, but serious disruption of regional and global businesses. Seasonal wildfires in the Western United States have been exacerbated by the emergency drought conditions under which California, the world's fifth largest economy, um, uh, operates one of the world's largest agricultural markets, where they consume over 40% of the state's water for agriculture. The blockage of the Suez Canal for six days this past March prevented an estimated $9.6 billion worth of trade per day and a massive disruption of global supply chains. With each physical manifestation of water risk, the floods, hurricanes, droughts, and each technical disruption, waterway blockages, dam malfunctions, among others, the capital markets respond quickly, repricing the operating conditions for the market and customers and ultimately each individual. I know that I certainly saw my supermarket shelves much emptier during the Suez Canal um, uh, blockage. However, traditional financial analysis is not yet caught up with the reality of severe water impacts we face. While these seemingly extraordinary events occur with increasing frequency, leading financial institutions are looking to the impact of their business activities that carry water-related exposure. Companies in the food, textile, energy, industrials, chemicals, pharma, mining sector, they account for use, pollution, or impact over 70% of the world's fresh water. How these critical industries to the global economy and their providers of capital, the investors, banks, credit rating agencies, and others, further impact the world's freshwater resources will directly affect whether we can operate within those planetary boundaries. So the business case for water stewardship and security could not be clearer. CDP's latest global water report, A Wave for Change, which was published last March, highlights the total potential financial impact of reported water risk at $301 billion. Now, conversely, the money required to mitigate these risks is reported at $55 billion. So the cost of inaction could be over five times higher than the cost of active risk mitigation. But we also know that water is, has not yet been widely reported. Um, outside of uh, the companies that we've seen through CDP. And at CDP, we believe that the capital markets, the commercial banks, the institutional investors, the rating agencies, insurance companies can offer unique incentives for change by ensuring that their investment and lending practices drive improvements in water security. Well, CDP has asked financial institutions to report on climate change and water security, soft commodity driven deforestation in the past, 2020 was the first year we introduced our financial services sector questionnaire, where we required financial institutions to look through their operational activities to evaluate the climate impact of their business activities. In our first year, we found that scope three financed emissions from business activities was 700 times operational emissions. Therefore, the finance sector is a high emitting sector. If we evaluate environmental impact, we cannot only look at emissions. There are inextricable linkages, as Sarah discussed, to water security and deforestation. 
And as such, CDP together with the Water Footprint Network, Mercer, and with the support of the Dutch Valuing Water Initiative is now engaging with the financial sector to develop the first ever set of standardized global security water reporting metrics for the sector. Through CDP's annual disclosure process, financial institutions will be requested to report against these metrics and a baseline analysis will benchmark performance. Research by the Banque de France shows 40% of financial institutions subject to climate reporting reduced their funding of fossil fuels versus control group. This is proof that the powerful impact of transparency and disclosure by financial institutions can have real world outcomes. As the world economy struggles with the devastating and ongoing global health crisis, financing a green and blue recovery may provide a positive impact. As financial institutions make increasing commitments to net zero and other sustainability goals, we glimpse the potential transformative impact that they could have to mitigate, the materially, the, mitigate materially the environmental crisis. And as providers and stewards of the world's capital, financial institutions and the capital markets writ large have the opportunity to require deeper transparency greater business selection and stronger mitigation. However, with ro without robust measurement, verification and accountability, achieving these ambitious commitments may be at risk. Therefore, measuring the return of each dollar, euro, pound, yen, invested, underwritten, lent by these providers of capitals for each client must include an evaluation of the associated environmental risk and impact. Water measurement may be nascent, but dismissing or discounting the current state future regulations and risks associated with water consumption or physical impact could have a significant financial downside. While standards and regulations in different markets continue to evolve, the personal experiences with environmental change that each of us face, water scarcity, extreme weather, supply chain disruption must catalyze action. We must start somewhere, even as metrics continue to emerge and evolve. I look forward to hearing from NBIM, Nordea, SEB, Lazard Asset Management about how their respective organizations are contributing to achieving a resilient and water secure future. So with that, Kate, let me pass over the mic to you. Thank you, Emily. A really, really powerful opening to our session together. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to join us today at, at your possibly first, maybe second World War II week, hopefully not the last. Um, I'm sure all of our viewers today will agree that many of the stats that Emily presented to us um, just now are are really stark and unfortunately the state of affairs is due to be starker as the AR6 report points out for us. However it's why I'm so encouraged to have such a powerful group of, of panelists joining us today. Collectively their institutions alone, just four of them, represent and hold influence over roughly around 1.6 trillion dollars of capital flows every year. This isn't small fry, this is the, 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 their institutions have the power to change the world. And so we're gonna spend the next 45 minutes or so talking to them to understand what type of steps they're taking at the moment, um, what more those individual institutions can do and any advice they might have for those financial institutions that have yet to uh, have their wake up moment with regards to water security issues. So I'm gonna start with my first panelist who's Katerina Hamar. She's the head of active ownership at Nordea. So Katharina, perhaps you can introduce yourself a little bit in Nordea and tell us a little bit about what actions um, Nordea is specifically taking to achieve a, a resilient future. Yes, so thank you very much for having me and uh, great meeting you all uh, digitally. Uh, I'm managing the active ownership team at Nordea Asset Management and we have been working with responsible investments ever since 2007. So uh, far ahead of when it was the big trend. Uh, and ever since we've been working with active ownership, engagement with companies and standard setters, and also to, to set expectations on companies, uh, doing ESG analysis, integrating ESG topics into our investment decisions and, and models and gathering data and all of that. So what are we doing concretely to achieve a resilient future? I think we do a lot. I don't think we have time to talk about everything, but um, I want to um, come back to what I think it was Emily who, who touched upon the Net Zero Asset Manager Initiative. We were a funding member of that, so we made a commitment to Net Zero. And of course, that will also influence uh, water. 
because I see a close connection between climate and water. Um, and what are we expected to do? It's of course, this is a long-term commitment, but we need to set more short and medium term targets and we also need to engage with the companies we invest in so the tools to achieve this is really to to engage with companies engage with standard setters uh, engage with industry um, initiatives and also to um, select the best companies uh, from this perspective and then also um, the last option would be to to decide not to invest in some companies that are laggards in this sense um, so an example that we've used or that we worked with is the pharmaceutical sector where we've been very active um, on water pollution and the supply chain in particular in india um, and work together with the pharmaceutical supply chain initiative. So I think that's that's very concrete on how we can actually have an impact. And of course, there is financials behind why we engage on this, because uh, we believe that this is a risk that wasn't properly managed and that will at some point translate into the financials. Um, so that's kind of the, the background to that. But so, so far, um, some very concrete actions on water pollution um, and then also engaging with CDP water and encouraging companies to, to um, uh, report so that we get the data and information that we need. That's another um, concrete example and maybe I'm running out of time so I want to Thank pass you. the word to my colleagues. Have you fabulous? Thank you, Katharina. I'll, I'll slip you that extra cash later that just to give us the, the name check, of course. Um, that's I must assure our, our listeners that's not a condition of being a panelist today, of course. But Katharina, I'm really familiar with the work that you guys are doing on pharmaceutical pollution. Um, and you know, I think most of the participants today or most of those watching won't won't believe believe it when I say that some of your leading uh, your leaders within the institution actually traveled to India and made an entire movie that showcases the the really severe human and environmental health implications of the activities taking place there it was a, it's a very powerful um, intervention and one that I think is delivering dividends so so thank you for that um, I'll move on to Annette Anderson now who's a senior sustainability investment specialist at SCB investment management Annette, tell us more about what SEB are doing. You similarly have been in this space for, for a fair long time now. Yeah, we joined actually or started working uh, in a structured way with sustainable investment in 2008. So we're slightly behind Nordea. You were before us. Um, I mean, we're working with both, uh, I would say, both sides of the coin. I mean, we actually have issued a blue bond, which okay kind of nice to do, uh, targeting uh, water issues around the Baltics. Uh, and we've also been working with WWF regarding water issues around the Baltics for a very, very long time. So that's one of the way we're working with it. We also work with integration of sustainability factors into our investment processes. Um, and I think that one of the issues has been, and still is, is a problem, is that nature and water still has, hasn't got a price in the financial accounting, which means that the financial markets have, you know, haven't had to take that into account. But if you look at what's happening in the world today with uh, supply chain management, I would say it's the, a huge risk for basically every company, because even if you've outsourced to come your production to somewhere in the world, uh, you're going to get hit. And I think that this year, actually, basically every continent got hit by either drought and or flooding. So this is not an issue anymore that we can say that this is happening in developing countries. This is actually happening here and now. And this is actually affecting a company's bottom line because they can't get the goods out. Uh, and if they do get the goods out, there's going to be delays in deliveries. Uh, so this is a, a huge risk that we've, so like, I shouldn't say that we have shied away from, but I don't think that we fully understood or still understand. So this is something that we're working a lot with. And obviously climate and water, uh, as Katrina said, is, is very much linked together. And 
we've also made commitments and said that we're going to be climate neutral in in or in our investments by 2040 so i mean we really have to work on that and we took the the step earlier this year that we actually stopped investing in, in fossil fuel extraction and, and power generation because you know this the risk is too high uh, and also with the stranded assets if you look at it from that point of view i think i'll stop there and let uh, the next speaker come in Thanks, Annette. Uh, really powerful examples there. And, um, the concept of stranded assets, of course, is, is something that has been bubbling away in the climate community for some time now with the concept of the carbon bubble, right? And reserves being locked into the ground if we are to um, achieve our 1.5 degree scenario and the, the impact on, on corporate finance um, or value at that point. Um, we've been exploring at CDP the concept of how water insecurity is already stranding assets as well. And there's a number of case studies that are emerging where, you know, $8.5 trillion mines are completely stranded and off the off the books for a period of time, or if not indefinitely, um, because of an inability to gain access to the water that they need to exploit that mine. Um, so it's a, a really powerful narrative and a, an example of how water related issues are playing out in real terms. Similarly, with regards to climate change, um, to speak to Catherine and your point, the AR6 report indicated that with every de one degree of warming that we will experience as a society, extreme rainfall will increase by 7%. And so we've got to be doing as much as we can to reduce that level of warming as quickly as possible um, so that we avert the worst effects of climate change on our water resources of course um, so it's really great to hear your commitment to 2040 um, yeah as you say you better get your skates on uh, so I'm going to hand over to Ivlan Flipler, who has, this isn't his first water week, World Water Week, um, he is becoming a, a staple feature on the agenda every year and we're always delighted to have him join us of course. Ivan is the Head of Environmental Initiatives at Norges uh, Bank Investment Management. Um, so Ivan, again, you're a long-term player in this space, can you give us a little bit of an insight as to what new interventions um, or existing interventions you guys have had success with at NBIM? Sure, thanks. I can mention some old and old and new things. And uh, thanks for that introduction. So um, I work at NBIM and we manage the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Norway, which is now at $1.3 trillion. And we own an average 1.4% of every listed company in the world. And our task is really to achieve the highest possible return over time. Um, um, but of course, responsible investment is a priority in managing the fund. And we think that responsible investment contributes to the increased returns over time. So I lead a small team of analysts that we engage with companies on environmental issues, uh, including climate change, but also water, which I am responsible for. And I thought I'd mention three things initially. First is that we have published expectations on water, which we communicate broadly. We've invested in 9,000 companies, so we can speak to all of them, but we have and do provide six points of what we expect them to do with concrete expectations on strategy, on reporting, on how it should be integrated into risk management. And these are sort of a starting point for our dialogue. Uh, the second thing I thought I'd mention is that we are a proud sponsor of CDP Water and of Kate's fantastic work. We've been there for 11 years since it started. Um, and really corporate disclosure is at the foundation of all of our work on responsible investment and on water. If we don't know what the companies are exposed to, and what they're doing to mitigate the risks. You know, we can't integrate the information into our investment decisions, and we can't know which companies we need to be speaking with. And that's the third thing I thought I'd mention is really our engagement with companies on this topic. Um, in 2020, we raised water management with companies we invested in, uh, in 90 meetings, and had over 130 written communications with companies, where we generally then write a letter to the board of companies asking them to um, increase disclosure or increase their ambition level. And sometimes these discussions are part of a broader discussion that we have with company management on the risks that they face um, related to plenty of ESG or financial matters and water is one, of, uh, one, uh, one element. But sometimes we proactively reach out and have specific deep dive discussions with the companies um, and uh, encourage them to incle increase their disclosures and ambitions. And one example is that we are now running an engagement with uh, over a dozen companies on their water targets. 
and to understand whether they're corporate wide, whether they're context based, whether they're focused on efficiency indicators, or um, whether they focus on catchment specific issues, um, you know, around the different areas that they operate. And there's positives and negatives on the different approaches and understanding why they choose the different, appro different diverse approaches and encouraging those that don't have targets to set them uh, is, is quite an, um, uh, it's a, we learn a lot from these dialogues. And we're still reviewing results, but anecdotally, we see that companies that we do engage have started to set the more ambitious quantitative targets to reduce their water consumption. It's really exciting to hear, Ivan. Thank you. The The world of target setting in, in the corporate water space is, is still somewhat murky. You know, what what is a good target? What isn't a good target? Um, do they have one or not? I think is a really important question um, as, a, as a basic starting point. Um, but we hope that with the emergence of the science-based targets for freshwater methodology that will come out early part of 2022, that that should help clear the way um, for, for better, more informed engagement and an, and an easier way to establish whether a corporate act action is, is sufficiently ambitious and placed in the right part of the value chain to ultimately mitigate risks and impacts and enable that company to, to thrive, which is ultimately really one of the reasons why we're all doing what we're, we're doing. So thank you for that. Um, over, last but not least, uh, to Dennis Neveling, who's the Managing Director and Analyst at Lazard Asset Management. Uh, Dennis is joining us today from New York. So, Dennis, you're a relative newbie to, to, um, to World Water Week, so it'd be really great for you to help the audience understand a little bit about what Laz Lazard is and then also um, what you're doing on this issue. Sure. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here as, as part of World Water Week. I've truly enjoyed the sessions that I've, able to, I've been able to attend uh, over the last few days. My name is Dennis Naveling. I'm actually not an ESG specialist. I'm a financial analyst that looks at the consumer stable sector for Lazard Asset Management. And I'm also a father that cares deeply about making sure future generations have access to clean water. Now, Lazard has a long history uh, in the asset management industry. and is a global firm that manages over 250 billion in assets uh, for our clients. Lazard has been incorporating ESG into its research uh, for over a decade. And as a financial analyst, um, somewhat similar to what Emily said on, on companies that I analyze in consumer staples, also known as CPG companies. I mean, they're in categories like beverages, food, and also personal care. And they are in particular, look at a water strategy very closely. So some of the key steps that we have taken is really integrating water strategy into our investment analysis and engaging with companies on water strategy. And I think the question is, you know, why do I incorporate a company's water strategy into my analysis? And the, first of all, water is very material for CPG companies. They use a, a significant amount of water in their own production, but they also use agricultural commodities at, that this audience knows use a lot of water. And then secondly, the usable water uh, for these companies is a, is a scarce resource and in many of uh, the regions that CPG companies operate. So sometimes when you think about these big companies, these big consumer staples companies, I think we forget that actually it's a local business. You know, they produce uh, their products uh, locally and they sell them locally. So you do have to have that social license to operate. And if one of those companies actually, um, you know, drives a shortage in a local watershed and uh, communities and other industries can't access the water, that can lead to significant impacts like consumer boycotts or even uh, product bans. And we have seen some examples um, definitely over the last few years. So from an investor perspective, I do think water strategy impacts the top line in the short to medium term, but then also potentially brand equity uh, over the long term. And it's especially important for our CPG companies. And we also engage directly with companies, um, like some of the other uh, fellow panelists have already said. I mean, the, we ask questions like, does a company have a comprehensive water strategy that really incorporates local communities and watershed health? Does a company set reasonable targets? And one of the things is, you know, sometimes you see these headline uh, percentage reduction targets, and, you know, if you, if you peel back the onion a little bit, you know, you know, they start at a really weak base sometimes. So I think mm -hmm. some companies can really uh, aim higher. And then uh, can the company's disclosure uh, be improved? I mean, only 50%, I was shocked by that number, only 50%, 5-0 of companies that were asked to disclose um, on water to CDP are actually disclosing. And many companies actually lack detailed disclosure on water and the sustainability report. So I think there's a lot that we can do uh, on engagement here. So as investors, I think we have a unique opportunity to communicate directly uh, with senior management and underscore the importance of water. And I believe a sustainable water strategy leads also to a sustainable uh, return for shareholders and for the planet. 
Thanks, Dennis. I'm glad you agree with that and that you're like, you, you align with our thinking on that front. What a relief. Um, I couldn't agree with you more with regards to aiming higher, and particularly with regards to corporate target setting. Our analysis of our um, of the, the companies that did respond in 2020, we looked at their pollution performance and we found that of the 3000 companies that we analysed, just 10 percent had a, any form of pollution related target. And of those 10 percent, just 4 percent were making any form of progress on these targets. Yeah, that's really woeful and it's in the gift of companies to 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 do something about this it's also of course in the gift of, of you guys um as influencers of the of corporate behavior to also ch make a change on that front and so i'm really delighted to hear about the activities that are underway um with regards to disclosure i think again i couldn't couldn't i couldn't agree more where we're seeing you know nine thousand uh, 9,000 companies respond on climate change every year. The, the performance with regards to water related disclosure across many sectors and across many geographies still has an awful long way to go. So it's even on this basic principle that I would love to see more, um, more energy and more focus in the year ahead. So we're going to come back to you, Katerina, um, if, you're, if you're ready and live and direct. Um, it's great to hear about the commitments that are in place at Nordea. Um, I think it'd be really helpful for our audience to understand it in, a, in quite practical terms, how you go about integrating what is, you know, a, a, big, a big and complex issue into your investment decisions or the particular topics that you expect each company to to um, to have achieved or certain behaviors that you look for every single time you make an investment decision how big's the team you know any type of insight that you can provide would be really helpful I'm sure uh, yes so the responsible investment team that's about 18 people um, working on um, ESG data and our proprietary model for ESG analysis. There's also work being done on ESG analysis. Of course, that is done with the investment teams as well. So it's a combination. Um, and then uh, active ownership activities, that's also going on in the team of 18. And um, supporting the different investment teams on emerging ESG issues. And we're always uh, in a chase for better uh, comparable and consistent data. Uh, so that's that's a big part of the work. When it comes to vo uh, water in particular, uh, of course, we, we differentiate between different sectors. So that's kind of the first step um, in our ESG analysis model is to what sector is this company in and how exposed is it to different ESG topics. If it's a, a sector that is, um, exposed to water risk, it will also look into is it in their own operations and or in the supply chain. Um, and then we start to gather the data points that we, we find either through CDP water or from the company itself. And then any missing pieces, that's, that's what we use the company meeting for, to gather additional information, uh, to be able to, to have a good, um, assessment as possible to make the, the investment decision. And if there are room for improvement, I guess that's where we will then propose an engagement with the company to, to kind of uh, fill the, the gaps, you could say. Uh, and maybe a bit general, but we, we also in our responsible investment policy, we have a few focus areas and water is one of them. And uh, where it's also clear what the expectations, it's not as great as the NBIM and AVIN's work on water expectations, uh, but, but at least um, we're trying to, to be clear towards the companies that we expect them to, to address and manage their water risks and then um, encourage them to, to provide us with, with the information that we need. Thanks, Katharina. Oh, sorry, after you. No, I just said uh, I, I'm happy to to hand over to some of my panelists. Colleagues well, before, here. before I move on um, to Annette, Katerina, I was just curious about whether uh, Nordea have, have set almost like a, a red line um, of, you know, if, if, if certain sectors or certain companies don't make it over this red line, that then you would take further action, either either divestment or some other um, some other more affirmative action. Does Nordea have that yet for water? I know it's 
generally not as straightforward for water as it is for, for climate change. No, we don't have that yet. We have it mm -hmm. on climate and human rights, but mm -hmm. not on water yet. Okay, okay. Well, I think it's maybe a space for us to advance our conversations over the next the next few months with financial institutions. There's a range of them that have come to us and said, so where do we, you know, what do we put on our blacklist? Mm. And it's on water, it's a tricky thing. You know, there isn't any one industry that I would say is absolutely no go. Like a, an oil and gas for GHG emissions is, is fairly clear cut, science is in, that's an easy win. Um, with water, it's it's unfortunately a little bit more nuanced than that, but I'm, I'm sure we can find something where we're working together and collectively um, as a group. Thank you, Catherine. I'll, I'll come back to you in a few minutes. I think that's a very interesting idea. So, yeah. Mm, thank you. I have them every now and again. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Annette, over to you. How is SCB um, bringing its commitment to water security into life, you know, putting your money to work for it? Yeah, uh, well... As, as uh, Nodea, uh, we also work in, in uh, parallel lines. We're not a massive team. We're only actually about five people because what we've said is uh, we want these issues to be uh, within the fund manager and investment teams because they have to set a price on the risk and the opportunities. Don't forget the opportunities. Not everything is just about risk. It's actually capturing the opportunities as well. We don't even we don't have a, a water statement yet. Uh, maybe after this, I'll make sure that we do. Um, and what we've been doing is that we have we also gather a lot of information from a lot of uh, suppliers, the CDP and MSCI and all the usual suspects out there. Uh, and we, after gathering that, we actually apply our own thinking on on those scores and. Uh, ideas that we get from them uh, and come up with different themes that we're working with. Uh, and another thing that we've been doing actually is we've been asking our clients for years running uh, to set which three SDGs are most important to them. And we'll bring that into our, invest our um, engagement strategy. And climate has been the highest or most uh, critical one and water is actually the second. So our clients are pushing us to engage more uh, on this topic and, and want to have more. Um, and I mean, the, I think the issue with water is, uh, I think as uh, Emily said that in the beginning, it's a very local issue as well as a global issue. And, and that makes it so difficult to, to address. And I think that as a financial institution, we do have some power uh, over the investments. And I think that we can actually push uh, companies uh, and engage actually with the and maybe even invest in the ones that are quite bad to push them over the threshold and not just be you know on the safe side and okay I'll just invest in the good ones because obviously if they are good or at least working in the right direction they're already there we need to work with the bad ones and get them on board uh, and and I think that that's what we're trying to do in a target um, pick companies that we think that we can influence either through that the management team is interested or they have the leverage uh, financially uh, to push them. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting perspective, Annette, and it's it's incredibly mature and, and nuanced, of course. You know, I think generally the p belief amongst the general population is that you must die best in order to be effective. And I think there is a strategy for di by divestment at some point. However, the yes. reality is that that company isn't going to disappear just because you've divested. Some other less caring institutional investor will buy those stocks and won't leverage their influence and drive change within the company itself. And so we're failing, we're missing an opportunity to try and trigger that transformation. Um, I think it's really helpful, hopefully, for our audience to, to think more and ruminate over that a little bit more over their time. Yeah, and I think also that's one thing that we've been discussing quite a lot, actually, is uh, impact in the real world mm. not just yeah. divesting and then yeah my figures looks well but then someone else picks up the the tab so how can we have an impact in the real economy in the real world not just yeah. our, our funny world our financial institutions 
yeah I, I i again i i applaud that annette i think it, um there is a, there is a direct link between risk and impact right and and those on the water community that are listening in today will probably be thinking about the fact that really what they care about is environmental impact we want to make sure that there's more water available and that it's a better quality and that those people and places that need it have access to it whenever they need it that's that's the driving force behind all of the work that we're doing um but there is a very clear link between those companies that have got a high water impact and the level of risk that they are exposed to. And that's why the two terms are often used interchangeably in the dialogues that we have with financial institutions, such as yourselves and others. Um, but more on this in a little while. Um, I, we're running out of time, so I'm going to go to Ivan and then Dennis, and then I will swirl around with one final question for you all, which is around um, what more you, you think might be needed in order to trigger the same type of groundswell of investor action that we're seeing in, uh, in climate for water. So maybe, Katrina and Annette, you can give some thought to that while you're waiting. But Ivan, um, over to you, you know, from a from it's it's very clear that NBIM wears its commitment on its on its sleeve. You know, it's it's all over your website, um, and you speak about it very very often. Um, again, how is that translating into into tangible um, investment decisions? Yeah, and this is a challenging field, right? Because we rely on two things. First, we rely on the disclosure from companies, and then we rely on our ability to assess that disclosure and weigh that one piece of information, which is water management, with all the other pieces of information that go into an investment decision. Um, and I think we're progressing on both fronts, right? Disclosure is increasing. And uh, every year we look at 500 companies in our portfolio, the ones that are most exposed, and assess their governance, their strategy, the risk management, and metrics and targets on water management. So it's around 50 indicators per company, or around 500 companies per year. And all of this information, together with uh, you know, metrics on water consumption, comparison to peer, peer groups uh, or industry sectors um, on uh, water intensity and controversies related to, amongst other things, water management, these things are integrated into system and made readily available for our portfolio managers to use. Now, um, we are not very prescriptive in how they're supposed to use that information, right? Our portfolio managers have a lot of freedom to adapt that information and into their investment decision based on their investment thesis, based on their sector, and based on the companies that they're looking at specifically. But we definitely try to help them and uh, discuss and challenge um, uh, whether they are integrating, you know, what risks in, uh, in a sufficient manner. And this will, of course, vary from manager to manager, but I think we're seeing a, a great interest uh, in these topics. And then, of course, we do have some divestments as well when we see that it goes beyond a certain threshold where it's not about overweighting or underweighting a little bit. And so we have over the last years uh, divested from 46 companies due to you know, unsustainable business models uh, from a financial point of view due to what related issues. Thanks, Ivan. And I, I know that you can't dive into that information in any great detail, but I can I can sense the anticipation from the audience and wanting more information on, on who are those companies and why did you do it? And there's a whole thesis, I'm sure, ready to be to be written on that. Um, but it's a very sensitive topic, I know. Um, but it is, I think, very powerful that one of the largest um, asset owners on the planet, in fact, the largest asset owner on the planet, takes these types of, of interventions. And whilst it might seem to our audience a small number of companies, 46 out of your 9,000, you know, it's it's not that material in, from a numbers perspective. I think when one reflects on the ripple effect that that has across the market, it's hugely powerful. Um, and again, not something that I know you deploy easily. Um, and it's always disappointing when that happens because it means that all of your other efforts haven't been successful. Um, but I think it's a really powerful powerful tool to deploy at the right place at the right time, of course. And it's also interesting to reflect on the fact of waiting, you know, that water is really just one in a huge number of, of factors in that the influence an investment decision. Um, I, I'm always humbled by that reality uh, when I'm faced with that with a number of institutions. You know, there was one, one particular institution, he said, you know, even in, in the E of the ESG, there's 47 indicators and water is one of those. And then you have everything else on top of that. So it is very common complex but one that I'm pleased to hear that there's movement on. I thank you for that. Dennis, 
over to you with regards to Lazard, you know, how is the commitment of the organisation to delivering better water outcomes being realised in your, your investment practices? Yeah, and so the, the first question that always comes up is, okay, what kind of price can you put on water? What's the value of water? And I think, you know, price is very different than the value of water. Water is a shared resource. Uh, there are monetary and non-monetary values of water. I actually saw yesterday's discussion from UNESCO on cultural values brought that home as well. So uh, we probably all agree that the current water price is not uh, reflecting the real value of water. And uh, so I have to take a forward-looking approach. And I I want to provide some details in terms of uh, what I do. Hopefully, uh, we have enough time. I'll try to uh, be brief. But uh, I look at a, a few approaches when I look at consumer staples in particular, the sector that I cover. So the first approach is, you know, what is the exposure to water stress? So um, when a company manufactures in a water scarce area, you know, physical, regulatory, and reputational risks that are much higher. And to assess that water stress exposure, I do use the Aqueduct platform uh, by WRI, which I found to be extremely helpful. And then we use revenue and location data for companies to estimate the exposure to water stress. And then uh, CDP also actually asked the water stress exposure question in its water questionnaire, also very helpful. And then we take this uh, location weighted exposure and compare it to a company's uh, margin profile. The idea being that you know, the higher your exposure to water stresses, and then you have a low profitability profile, you're probably most vulnerable. And then in turn, you probably need a very strong water strategy. And then the second approach that we take is, you know, how efficient are these companies in terms of, um, you know, efficiency metrics on water intensity? And I know that only captures uh, the company's operation, but what I found in my research actually is that there's, there are some, some significant laggards within that metric. So there's still, you know, lots to go in terms of improvements and there should be some, some easy wins actually. And then third approach is, does a company have a water stewardship strategy? I mean, going, is the company going from, its own operations to investing in the water system versus just extracting water? Um, do they have replenishment projects in place? Are they looking at watersheds? Are they helping the water quality access? Are they looking at communities? Are they improving the water health? Uh, are they actually looking at the supply chain? We talked at the beginning in terms of agricultural commodities, how impactful that is. So do they have solutions or are they working on innovations there? So that point is really about thinking, um, is a company thinking outside of its own operations when it comes to water? And then the fourth scenario, which is, or the fourth approach is really analysis of different price levels of water, totally recognizing it's not about um, identifying the full value of water, but I still think it's a, it's a helpful tool. Uh, so some companies that are actually in attendance or were in attendance this week, they use an internal price of water that is multiple, multiple times higher than what they actually pay. I think uh, CDP said it's only 7% of uh, companies that actually disclose like an internal uh, water price. And you know, we can look at prices from utilities globally, but they don't reflect uh, the price that the companies are actually paying and they definitely don't um, incorporate future risks. So what we do is, or what I do is I, I stress test kind of uh, operations at different price levels to see you know, how big the impact is on business. So when we combine then those four approaches that I've talked about, we usually get a good idea of a company's water risk profile and the water strategy. And then that becomes part of the overall scenario analysis for a company when we, when we analyze a company. Hopefully that was helpful, not too detailed. Fabulous. Absolutely, Dennis. It was pitched just perfectly. Um, I think that, that yeah, I could talk all day again about it. Um, it's it's great to see the, the focus on efficiency and intensity, but also your acknowledgement that that is in some ways an imperfect indicator and that there is more to, to do on that front. You know, I think I can hear some of my water colleagues grimacing and saying, well, you know, if just because a company is efficient doesn't mean that their environmental impact is reduced, right? They haven't necessarily released more water into the environment and strengthen that resilience of the basin so um but again as you say it's it's a really important starting point that as a basic level you know companies should be hitting that as a as a as a relatively uh, easy win in some respects and on the value or the cost of water um there was a piece of research recently published by barclays that indicated that the true cost of water is actually three to five times higher than the companies um are disclosing at the moment um so we're seeing governments around the world move quite significantly in increasing the price of water that companies have to pay for it. And I think that is an inevitable policy response, not only to the water crisis, but to the climate crisis as well. As climate change worsens, we're gonna have even less water to play with. And therefore we need to deploy different tactics to make sure that the people that are, um, do have access to it 
or the companies that do have access to it are paying what's what's required and what's expected. So thank you for those really, really great insights, Dennis. As I said, we've got a last last conversation, last question that I want to pose for you, and it's it's picking up this climate narrative really, and it's one around ambition. I'm in addition to running CDP's Global Water Program, I'm also the the water lead for the COP26 Climate Champions team, and we're seeing, you know, as always, a huge groundswell of investor support, outpouring of commitments such as the the Net Zero Asset Alliance, Asset Manager Alliance that Katarina mentioned earlier. Um, we're seeing CEOs of, of major financial institutions standing up saying, we care about climate change. Let's get to it. Uh, let's be ambitious policymakers. But when you turn to look at that for water, it is silent. I can't honestly name one institution at the moment, let alone 500 getting behind a, a major alliance um, to talk and to raise, to, to encourage policymakers, not only to prioritize steps that they need to take to manage our water resources more effectively, but to showcase their ambition um, to do so. And in our world, this, um, this is really vital to triggering that transformation that we want to see from policymakers themselves, because they're ultimately the ones responsible for making sure that the money is going into water resources management that's needed for, to allow us to thrive. So what more, Katarina, to you first, what more do you think might be needed in order to trigger the same sort of groundswell within within the financial sector that we're seeing on climate for water is it just the lack of a of a of a, a vehicle at the minute is that what we're missing or is there something else do you think uh i think this is a very tricky question to be honest uh, a big question and and also i mean you've already touched upon the price on water but there's also a conflict with that uh, considering the right the human rights to, to access to clean water. So how to handle that? Um, I think that's challenging. Uh, what can we do? Raise awareness, continue to, to kind of push and engage uh, standard setters, policy makers. Um, yeah, I, I don't have the, the kind of solution here, unfortunately. So I'm, I'm eager to hear from, from my other colleagues because I think this is Have really you. tricky. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. Um, I just well, I, I hope that we can count on you if we do find some way of ensuring that the investor voice on water is, is heard at COP26. I'll, I'll come back to you so we can add yours, add, add yours to that call as well. Yeah, of and, and as I started off saying, I mean, I think climate and water is closely connected. So maybe there's mm -hmm. a way to sneak it in. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's captured also in, in all the climate commitments. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I think it's an and, right? I think that's really mm. and and all of those things. Fabulous. Yeah. Thank you. Annette, how about you? Uh, I think it has to do a little bit with maturity. I mean, we've been so focused on climate uh, and I think that now everyone's all like aware that it's a dire situation with the climate. And I think that water will be the next issue that we've been discussing. Um, and I think that we are going to get some help from the uh, EU taxonomy coming in. Uh, because there's going to be a lot more transparency uh, and clients uh, are going to and our peers as well are going to be able to see how we tackle these issues so uh, and I think that's going to drive change in a different way because we can't hide uh, anymore um, and say that we don't have the data that we can't disclose so I think mm -hmm. I think it'll be a effect of the taxonomy coming into place uh, and all the regulations that will be hitting us yeah, thanks, Annette. And again, for, for most of the most of the participants, I think it's safe to say for World Water Week, don't live in our world, right? So they won't know what a taxonomy is and they don't know what sustainable finance sort of renaissance is underway at the moment. But it's safe to say that the the time for business as usual approaches to environmental considerations in investment management is is almost over um, and that you've got legislation um, changes all over the world in almost every jurisdiction that will require these guys and their peers to disclose specifically that what they're doing to manage the risks and impacts of their investment practices as it relates to climate change and then also water and other environmental issues. Um, it can be daunting for institutions such as ourselves to be confronted with that new reality, um, but I think it's, it's a vital one. I do too, and I think actually what is going to happen, or what I think what, what is happening is that the EU taxonomy is pushing sustainability criteria into the financial reporting. 
in a mm -hmm. way that we haven't seen before. Uh, and for those of you, you who don't know the taxonomy, it's actually a classification system of what is sustainable and what isn't. That is all it is. So that we yeah. all speak the same language and we are disclosing the same metrics to make it transparent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's from, again, from an environmental perspective with the, um, the, the traditional tools of the trade to trigger environmental outcomes are pipes, pumps, toilets, treatment plants. And what we're talking about here is is really quite geeky, you know, accountancy level of regulation. Um, but CDP loves this type of stuff. And I know you guys are, are all over it as well. And to trigger, we believe that this is really fundamental legislation that will trigger systemic change. It will turn the financial sector into a tool and a force for good, we hope. Um, and that's that's one of the major reasons why I get out of bed every day. <laughs> it's the thing that's keeping me optimistic. Um, and it, as Emily mentioned earlier, we, we at CDP, we're currently designing um, our water disclosure framework for financial institutions. Um, and that will be released next year as a way to aid and support all of those institutions that we'll target. There's about 700 in our list um, to help them start to get ahead of the curve so that when the regulation hits, you'll be ready and, and, and prepared for that. Um, so thanks for highlighting that, Annette. It's a, a really important insight. Ivan, what about you? What do you think? What more might be needed to trigger this groundswell of investor action? How can we get more of them standing up and saying, we care about water, we want more action to be done? It's a good question. I don't think I have a perfect solution, but there are areas I've made two reflections. One is that we need to have an understanding in the investment com investor community about the financial materiality of water. Mm -hmm. And we see you know, we see uh, anecdotes, we see community opposition, we see drought affecting companies, but there isn't an understanding that this is something that it can affect everyone. Whereas in climate change, everybody understands this affects the whole economy. Mm. The second thing is that on water, we don't have an easily measurable progress and we don't have a fully understood goal. On climate change, we know where we're supposed to be headed and we can mm. measure the carbon dioxide. Uh, you know, climate risk is a bit more challenging, but we don't have the same on water. You know, we're talking about water stewardship and stress, and there's so many components to that, and it's localized. Mm -hmm. And so it's so complex that you know we're we're not understanding that everybody's at risk, and we don't know how to measure who is at risk and uh, find out how they're doing. So unless mm -hmm. we as a water community can sort of define that for the investment community, uh, we're going to struggle to get everybody along. Mm. Thank you, Ivan. Um, it's really insightful. And I'm glad you said we within the water community and that includes yourself, of course, in that. Uh, finally, over to Dennis. Um, we've got just a, a couple of minutes left, Dennis, if you could be brief with your, your response. But I'm really keen to, to hear any insights that you might have, pearls of wisdom about how we trigger this groundswell of support for water from it within the within the sector. Yeah, sure. I think the understanding uh, of the connection between water and climate change is important. Uh, yeah, I guess it's been said, I think the integration of uh, water in your analysis, uh, if it, especially if it's material, I think if that's integrated in the analysis and then the engagement happens with companies and it becomes part of the normal conversation um, mm -hmm. instead of you know, having a specific call on water, but having it as part of the normal conversation that you, know, you have with the management team or with the company, I think that brings home the point how important and how core it is, uh, especially if it's material for, for a business. And then on the reporting side, I think uh, there are some great examples uh, from companies, but overall, I think the reporting today is just insufficient. And I can go back to the CDP disclosure that we talked about. And with that, I, I have to say the uh, CDSB a report that came out uh, earlier this week uh, is definitely helpful in that as well. So those will be mm -hmm. the things I will mention. Okay, thank you so much, Dennis. And thank you everybody for your time and, and insights today. I think it's it's really important that we bring our worlds together, right? The water world and the finance world, because it's only through better understanding of each other that we will ultimately succeed in supporting each other to manage the risks, manage the impacts, and ultimately deliver the water resilient world that we all clearly deserve and need. So thanks for your time. And I will hand back over to Sarah. Thank you so much, Kate. And thank you so much to all of the panelists for this 
fantastic insight for conversation. And my key takeaways that I will bring with me today are definitely the need to continue to showcase for the need of, that water and climate are intrinsically connected. And that we really can't forget the opportunities. We can't just focus on risk. We really need to focus on the opportunities as well, as well as the need to have an impact in the real world and the real economy. And therefore divestment becomes a bit tricky and it might, might seem like an easy option. And of course, investors do have a unique possibility to speak directly to senior management and really, really are in a special, special position there. And of course, we also need to aim higher in terms of corporate target setting, not least when it comes to pollution targets where we're really lagging behind. So before we get cut off here, um, I'd just like to say thank you so much again. Thank you so much to uh, CDP, to all of the panelists, to Sweden Sustainable Investment Forum as well uh, for having us. And thank you so much to the audience as well. It's been a pleasure. And I really, I'm really, really excited to keep the conversation going on water and finance. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks all. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.